Yeah, I'm still not showing live, but I'm always a little, there we go. A little bit behind. Uh, yeah, Aldo was talking to me via Skype over here. Let me answer him real quick. So, let's see if I can get this. Um, uh, my brain's not functioning. Hey, Todd, how you doing? Uh, what is it? What is that called? A chat box? Chat room? I don't know. <laughs> Messages? What is that? Huh? Where people can type. Oh. Streaming chat. Streaming chat. And we're going to figure all this out at some point. Hey, Epi. And Rhino Dino. Isaiah Rising. Isaiah Rising, is that, is that Davis? I don't know. That's interesting. Davis, is that you, Isaiah Rising, or is that someone else? <clears throat> Maybe it's Aldo Giazzi. Trolls off. So is Chuck going to be on tonight? Do we have Chuck tonight? Chuck is trolls, but he's the bot. Well, he's he's going to be... He's trolls. Um, <laughs> Chuck is the embodiment of trolls all. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, <laughs> he set up a whole bunch of new little automatic bots to uh, get stuff working. Oh, good deal. Um, so, do some automatic stuff. Yeah, so me, I'm guessing that's Davis, because when you ask Davis a question, he never gives you a yes or no answer. He just sort of yeah. Goes that... <laughs> if he hears the question at all, that's really the. Uh, yeah. I've, I've discovered in Skyping Davis that I'll say X, Y, and Z, and then he'll ask me, "Where's X, Y, and Z?" I'll, it's in the Skype chat. Just scroll back up, and he he doesn't he doesn't read what you <laughs> what you text him. Davis lives in the moment. Yes, there you go. He, he's got his own thing going on. Actually, he's working on the rogues gallery, I think is what he's got going on right now. So, that's good. That's good. Yeah, now he answered it. After we called him out, now he, he's answered it and said, uh, <laughs> yes, it's me, Davis. <laughs> uh -huh. For those who don't know, Davis is uh, one of the original co-founders of Troller Games, and uh, he does a lot of writing for us now. Um, Co-creator of Castles and Crusades, World of Inzay, all kinds of stuff. Good stuff. Uh, Epi, I still get was it Epi? I still got the squeaky chair. I gotta fix that. Yeah, you do, man. Yeah, I kind of like it, but yeah, I'll bring down. Some... Well, you know, I think I mentioned it a couple weeks ago. There's that gamer's chair I want because the arms go up and I can slide chair under the desk when I'm scooting around the office like an idiot. So, you know, doing the do or whatever it is I do. So let's give it a few more minutes before we dive into this trick to the trade. Um, so you're heading back yeah, to Maine be. here soon. I am. Probably at the end of the month for a couple months before it gets too hot down here. Uh, <laughs> it's a coming. <laughs> yeah. yeah, today today when you and I were talking, I don't know if you heard the thunder, it had gotten up to like 88, and it was so unbearably hot. Uh, but, you know, just humid. And all of a sudden, the storm came for about, you know, 10 minutes pulling it right off, so it's nice right now. It's not too bad down here. It's nice and cool, but I think it got up to 95 or 94 or something, but it's not been too bad. I had to... Uh, yeah, that... Yeah. Well, my goal is to get out of here before it hits 90 and, and come back when it's going to be a little bit less. I had beans for dinner. I don't even know what I had for dinner. <laughs> I think I had my normal mashed potatoes and roast beef. <laughs> I eat that a lot. <laughs> yeah, I could I could survive on potatoes, I think. Yeah, and no, I do like potatoes. Uh, but, uh, I made a steak the other night, did I tell you? Right? You made a what? A steak. Look at you! you I got... know, I thought I, would, I channeled the inner sea. They had some on the sale. And uh, I got... I got some, and then the last time I think I had steak was when I nearly choked to death up here at the cabin with you and Kenneth. I remember that. <laughs> we... I, I know, it was so funny. I was, you were telling a story or something, and I had taken a piece of meat and I was swallowed. And I knew it was stuck, but you know, like an idiot, I didn't really point out to people that I was dying. And to your credit, you just kind of looked over at me and said, are you choking? <laughs> <laughs> 
And I just kind of waved for him a little bit. And he just kept on with your story, seeing if I could figure it out. And eventually, <laughs> Kenneth was trying to put me the hind leg. Yeah, I remember uh, Kenneth got the, the meat. I remember once years ago, I was when I was stationed in Hawaii, there's a whole bunch of us eating dinner, and Brian, a buddy of mine, were, he was telling some tale or something. And Brian was very animated. He's always kind of in motion. Yeah, a really nice guy, and uh, yeah. I started choking on a piece of steak, and so I'm sitting to his right, and he's jabbering and jabbering, and without missing a beat, without slowing down his story, without anything, he just leaned forward and walloped me on the back, and that piece of meat from flying out of my mouth, and he just kept on talking. <laughs> well, that's just pretty cool. <laughs> yeah. yeah. That's a bard in the yeah. making. Beans <laughs> That's um, not good, Google. That's not good. <laughs> no, that's just dangerous, dangerous stuff. No, I gotta grab it. I gotta grab a drink, uh, then I'll drive back, and then maybe we can start. I think that's good. I think that'll be good timing. All right, I'll be right back. Yeah, we've got. Um, we released. Uh, I think it's the 18th or 19th installment of GM's Tricks of the Trade today. I've noticed as I'm writing these things that they're getting a little bit longer. I'm getting a little more uh, long-winded in my Tricks of the Trade, but uh, I suspect that's only going to get worse. I do like what we're doing with the continuous you know, taking one kind of subject matter and discussing it uh, through and through. That that I do like. Uh, so we'll see how that keeps playing out. I think next week we're doing, I think I put it down, we got uh, Balancing Monsters, and then the week after that, uh, starting low-level campaigns. I'm trying to segue all of them together, so we'll see. I really kind of need to uh, cull all these together and start getting them organized, because what it, you know, it occurred to me with this thematic approach we're doing, I could go back and revisit some of the earlier tricks of the trade and expand on them you know, this, that, and the other. So that yeah. might be something we we dive into in the near future. Um, but these things are getting longer and longer. Yeah. Verbosity well, is right. a sign of old age, just says Google Flex. <laughs> <laughs> well, you, you may be right there. <laughs> you know, it gets, it gets you a chance to um, to uh, kind of revisit them, like you said, and then, then we can work on the thematics of them. I'd like to see a place on the web where we could put them up and right. have them listed by date but you can also scroll through them or click on them through themes and those sort of things yeah no that would be cool it'd be really and to get it really kind of organized uh, rhino's been following since the, the first one very cool yeah remember the first ones we did were really kind of short i mean like two and three sentences and when i was writing i guess when i was reading the one from the today uh or yesterday no, not this morning i didn't uh I was thinking, good lord, this is just, just going on forever. <laughs> this is a lot of jibber jabber. Yeah, they, they, they do get longer, especially when you do the, um, you know, you've been doing a little intro now with them. Right. Uh, but I think it's fine. It ties them all together. And, and, you know, that's why we're here is to, to talk about this stuff. Yeah, that's so one of the things that, well. one of the reasons I'm getting a little bit more verbose uh, is because some of the problems are kind of complex. I mean, they're not... Like complex, but they're they, they're a little bit more involved. The question uh, that Matt had sent over about uh, uh, how to handle passing notes, you know, that that type of stuff. It, it's actually I, I gave that a lot of thought because it's a it's a relatively complicated, you know, problem at the table. Uh, all right. Well, without further ado, uh, unless you've got something. Um, no, I don't. I'll, I'll, point, I'll point out that uh, uh, the subs uh, that are subbing us now, I sent out uh, your discount for you. should get that in an email. Uh, so look at your emails for that, Epi and a few other you guys that have, uh, are subbing us. Uh, check the stream chat uh, if you guys are noticing that we've got a few new bots in there that are kind of cool. We've got some multi points and stuff. Uh, that Chuck can point out in, in the stream here in a little bit. And uh, one other thing, yeah, if you have any questions while we're doing this, just list them over there, and one of us will hopefully catch it. And uh, we're happy to answer any questions you got. Sounds good. And the really cool news that you you glossed over, and I think I took out of the, the email this morning, 
was that we got Troll Lord yeah, Games. Did. We got the, the channel. So what was that? What was involved with that? Well, it was basically we had to go um, and uh, we had tried to get it when we first started, but someone in Sweden had it. Sweden. We couldn't reach them. They had never streamed with it. Uh, but it turns out it was a trademark uh, issue, and we got a hold of Twitch, and they were able to take care of that real quick. So. Cool. cool. Yeah, so we're now not... We were Troll Lord Zero One, I think. Uh, yes, we were. It, I believe I said that up a long time ago. <laughs> you know, whenever we went to the CDC out there in uh, San Francisco, we, I think that's when we started the channel and promptly did yeah, nothing with it. Yeah, and I made you know, a couple of them, and I had Twitch 1984, baby. I have no idea where they came from. <laughs> there you go. But now we're officially yeah, Troll Lord Games. We are. All right, bring it on. All Number right, one. so uh, someone took the real epi. Yeah, it's just not. It's just not right, man. It's just not right. All right, so uh, this week's uh, GM Tricks of the Trade. I dove into uh, how to do unusual travel, unusual treasure for high level adventurers, high level parties. Uh, if you run any kind of game that lasts for a while, that, you know, 10, 15, 17 sessions, whatever it is, that your characters start gaining levels and you've got a thematic to it. If you're not, you know, there's ways that you can do just one-offs and do that and it's just this week we're doing a dungeon, this week we're doing another dungeon, this week we're doing a castle, that type of thing. That's great. But if you're doing campaign arcs uh, where you're building characters, building the story, building all of these things... Uh, treasure gets a little bit um, challenging as you gain levels, especially for classes like the monk and cleric and uh, some of the others that aren't that are a little bit specialized and need specialized equipment and stuff like that to do. So uh, you, you'll run out. I mean, if you're depending on how generous you are, you'll start running out of treasure about fifth, sixth, seventh level. Uh, even if you're stingy, you'll start running out of treasure about tenth level. A lot of the items really aren't anything other than a different item with the same magical ability so uh, the treasure gets kind of eaten up fast and then when you get to 10th level and 12th level and what have you a wizard's power and a cleric's power begins to dwarf the magic items that you award them so even then it becomes a little bit uh, uh, challenging to make the treasure worth the adventure that they've gone on so over the years I've kind of developed a few things that I do uh, to compensate for that and the the foremost one and this is the one that I listed as number one in the GM's tricks this morning was a uh, land is treasure I'm a huge advocate of this because I do campaign type things uh, I like to over time start building relationships with NPCs particularly NPCs in power who may have hired the characters at some point or minimally the characters have interacted with because what they did uh, salvaged something of that local nobility or what have you uh, so Land is Treasure becomes a huge part of it. it, it so much so that I wrote the, the section in the Castle Keeper's Guide. And there's a whole, I think it's chapter 10, it's, it's all it discusses is Land is tre Treasure. How to kind of adapt it, do things with it, uh, how to award a ranger treasure, Land is Treasure, as opposed to how to award an assassin Land is Treasure, and that type of stuff. And of course you can easily, if you use the book, you can easily, you know, use those charts for other classes as well. But essentially what Land, is, Land for Treasure does is it, is it gives the player and his character a vested interest in the game. Now that they've been awarded a small barony on the edge of a dukedom or a kingdom, uh, they're a player now. They're part of it. They're, part, they're more part of the story than they were when they're just adventuring. Uh, that couples with what it really brings a GM on, on the other side of the screen is the GM can now build a whole new slew of adventures that go with it. You've got interactions with the duke and now the duke needs this and the baron needs this and the king is over here doing this so you've got all kinds of stuff that you can you can bring into play when you use land as treasure uh it, it i have found it's probably the best most players not all but most players kind of respond well to it they don't um, they like to be part of it it builds their character it builds who they are the whole nine yards um and it doesn't have to be complicated i've, I've done it both ways when i first started doing it it was the barony of his stall, if I remember back in like 86, that Todd's Paladin got. And I did, I mean, I've still got the notes back there buried in the mailroom. It's just mountains of, of how much taxes were required, how much crops were grown, the wealth in cattle and sheep, and 
how many villages and the castles, battlements, walls, and men at arms. And we had worked all this out. And I found over over time, it wore Todd out. And over time, it became less play because you're kind of doing uh, papers and paychecks. And that's a little bit, you know, it's not, it's not nearly as fun as chopping off an orc's head. Um, so I began, as, as time progressed, I began to kind of back off of that and just do it as a wash. We did this not long ago. Uh, again, Todd's character, he purchased or inherited, I think he inherited uh, the Cocklebar Inn and Tavern, which is in Inn's Meat and the Dark and Full. And we didn't really do anything with it. Uh, he's got a room there, and he gains, like, I think he earns, like, 20, 25 gold pieces a month from it that's his to do with whatever he wants. And then he's hired people to run it. So, basically, what it's become for him is his character now has roots, and he's got somewhere that he can go and uh, settle in and recoup from adventures or what have you, do a little role-playing. And because this particular area is kind of at the center of several crossroads, it gives me another avenue of, of feeding adventure material to Todd and the party and whatnot. Uh, so Land is Treasure works, for me, works extremely well, and I think if you adapt it to your game, uh, especially for the campaign arcs, uh, you can make it work for you as well. Um, are, we, are we doing any giveaways tonight? Are we doing, what are we doing? Well, we didn't, we didn't really plan that, um, but I think we should probably do uh, at least one of the uh, digital of CKG. Uh, I didn't set it up with Chuck, so we, we'll see how as this progresses, if he can catch up with one. If not, we'll just do one random. Sounds good. Uh, Chuck, let's so. see if you can, you can not, you can not, welcome to Troll Lord Games, Chuck. <laughs> Basically, ask the things and expect them to happen. <laughs> There's that old, that old sitcom. Yeah, he says he can explain. Okay, good deal. Good deal. So, we're going to be giving away a, a digital copy of the Castle Keeper's Guide. That book is really, uh, I started to pull, actually, I did an image of it. This is the cover of the second printing. We're headed to a third printing very soon. Um, the book is it was written by myself. Uh, Davis and James Ward, Casey Christofferson, Jason Vey. Uh, it has a, a lot of luminaries. I think Mike Stewart got involved in a lot of, I, I'm probably going to miss a couple there, but we all kind of dove in, and it's really this huge 250-page um, book that just filled with GMing stuff. I mean, in most of it, though it has, as you can see, Castles of Sage on the, the book there, you can easily adapt most of that material to your own game. Uh, really good book. Uh, so the next uh, trick of the trade, Character Renown. This one is a little bit trickier. I actually like to do this, and it's something I've really started to do more recently. Um, but the idea that as adventurers are moving their way through whatever life, kingdom, whatever that they're doing, wherever they're, they're stomping around, they're going to earn a name for themselves, good or bad, one way or the other. People are going to know who they are. They've slain the giants, scattered the orcs, you know, plundered the dragon hole, cleaned out these dungeons, uh, what have you. Word gets around. Even if they don't actively try to spread that word, it's going to get around. They're going to sell something in town, and questions are asked, and people learn and pick up this, that, and the other, uh, and word spreads around. So that renown actually can translate to both some great role-playing opportunities, but also to a game mechanic. I frequently do it very, very simply by um, they're well-known, they go to a town, and I give them bonuses on their, their checks with various and sundry uh, NPCs, barkeeps, uh, store, tavern, you know, uh, storekeepers, uh, store shopkeepers, then uh, the guardsmen, even the, the town elders will sometimes take. Uh, they'll be more respectful, differential, and all, the, all this other stuff that uh, that helps out. So diplomacy checks, uh, charisma checks, they get a bonus one, maybe a bonus two, depending on how they're role-playing it. So it translates, character renown translates quickly into um, into something the characters can actually use. Uh, it kind of ties in with what we talked about last week with uh, the nobility. Uh, they can literally just write down on the character, plus one on charisma checks, when in a town in region X. Uh, this way they have, they, they, Whatever monster that they killed or whatever they've done actually translates to gain to something solid in the game that's more than just gaining gold and whatnot. And the nice thing about renown from the GM GM point of view is you can change it. You can get rid of it uh, if they start doing things that are a little bit obnoxious or you know 
I don't say evil, but kind of intending in that dire- that direction, their renown is it's reduced, and they they lose their bonus charisma check. They might be able to intimidate someone more, but people don't love them like they do, or they don't look forward to them coming like they did. Uh, and this actually has kind of a it's a way to help. I don't want to say control. That's not the right word, but it's it's uh, it's a way to to govern behavior so that your characters aren't always attacking NPCs and aren't always doing stuff or, or going off off the rails as as players sometimes do. Um, I know this because I was a player who frequently goes off the rails. But I DM, you know, I mentioned Todd a couple of times, but he's actually uh, um, I've gamed with him since 1985. We, he and I have this great kind of rapport together, but good Lord, that dude can be hard on NPCs. I swear to God, when he started playing the game, he started making lists of NPCs he was going to kill. <laughs> now it's just become this joke. He's going on the list. <laughs> so, so part of it is to kind of come back to Todd's list. And I told him the other day that my NPCs are going to start keeping character lists. So <laughs> just to kind of get back at it. <clears throat> he was unabused. <laughs> yeah, no more hunting dates in new towns. <sighs> yeah, that, that whole end of things. So the third thing that uh, I discussed on this GM's Tricks of the Trade was extraordinary items. Extraordinary items, um, I'm not really sure how a lot of the other game systems do them. I know Dungeons & Dragons 5e has them in there. Uh, I'm pretty sure Dungeon Crawl Classics does and Swords and Wizardry. I'm sure they've all got something like it. And, and the C&C version in, in our Monsters & Treasure, it's got... I don't know, five or six, eight, ten tables of these things. And they drive me crazy because almost every monster has them. You end up, so you end up rolling just this stuff. And flavor text, it's really kind of cool because it gives you something. There's a harp or there's a scroll case or what have you. And that's kind of nice. Um, but it really, in game, in the playing of the game, it doesn't translate to much because they can't do anything with a harp. How are you supposed to transport a harp? Uh, and it's not magical, so you don't need it. The bard's not going to use it to, you know, sing his way out of whatever encounter because it's a heart. Uh, so they end up selling it, and it becomes this kind of, I don't know, as much a, a, a millstone as anything else. So I've kind of shied away from using them, except when I want to, t- when I take a little bit of time and actually give them a special property. So the 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 item that they find, the extraordinary item, actually has meaning in the overall campaign or context in the whole thing. I remember recently, and I think I kind of touched on this in the trade, uh, the Tricks of Trade, and, um, I had them discover this scroll case, and it was filled with letters. Some of them were love letters between these two, a noble and a, uh, or I believe it was a fighter, it might have been a ranger, but some of them are reports that this ranger was clearly on a mission for this person, and he had to go back and report to her, but he never did. He died, so they took this scroll case, and it became kind of the adventure where they they returned it to her and because there were love letters involved as well there became this kind of nice uh, subtext to the whole npc encounter between uh i think she was a baroness i can't maybe a countess i can't remember she was in the kingdom of maine but um uh it it created a whole bunch of role-playing opportunities and it also created an adventure in and of itself uh which led to more npcs in the game and because they befriended this npc now they have an ally in this region So in the overall campaign context, this scroll case became much, much bigger than a simple, you know, 400 gold pieces of treasure. So you can take extraordinary items and really kind of twist them, uh, give them a little bit of life to it. It it takes a little bit more work, I think, than just rolling it and giving it to them. But uh, if you do it, it's it's worth it in the end. Uh, Do you have any questions? Any, Tim, anything you want to throw in before I get on to four? Yeah. Uh, Well... We're going to uh, we're going to a uh, a raffle here. Uh, as soon as Chuck puts it right out there on the screen, uh, we've got two more tips to go. I think it's going to be a three minute raffle, so I think you're going to have to do uh, whatever it says over there. Um, so once he'll get that going here in just a second. Okay. Um, Are you telling me I got to ramble uh, on a little bit? Yeah, you're gonna have to ramble on for at least three minutes, but you can ramble on about anything for three yeah. minutes. So you're fine. <laughs> I think we're safe but in that department. <laughs> you're you're on three. Uh, we've got four and five to go. Um, and uh, oh, I just want to ask people uh, if we can um, see what they think about the the night one as opposed to the afternoon. 
um, it's it's harder for us because we both have lives and, and wives and, and all that sort of stuff. But uh, eventually we'll be running some games on here. Those will probably be at night. Uh, but um, you know, if you like these at night, let us know. Just throw throw some info out there and give us some feedback. Really, on on what you think about these uh, Twitch things. If you'd like to see something different, how you like to present them. Um, it was my fault this time that the uh, little images aren't up for each one. I, uh, I, I bitched and bitched about Steve not putting them up. And then he asked me, he said, did you make any? And I, I did not even think about it. So. Yeah, I was putting my, my, my picture of the Castle Keepers guide up there. And uh, I thought, wait a minute, those those uh, thingamabobs. Uh, what do you call I, yeah. uh, You call them something. They're probably not called thingamabobs, but I'll go with that. Yeah. <laughs> well, that, that's technical. Term. I, I just... Um, you know, basically we'll figure it out and get it all fancy, but this is pro world after all. We don't really get too fancy. <laughs> yeah, we'll we'll, um, we'll we'll do as tro- what is what is the dude the dude saying? the dude abides the troll abides. So <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's, that's the way it is. Uh, so Epi Epi's <laughs> voting for evening nice. streams. Uh, you know, and to be honest with you, from my perspective, the evening stream is kind of nice because. In the middle of the day, we got so much work to do. We're working on, you know, so many projects. We got four, three Kickstarters that we're, four, I think, that we're hammering on at the moment. Um, so to take two or three hours in the middle of the day, in the middle of the week, is actually kind of tough. I kind of like this, uh, this live streaming at night. It's kind of cool. Yeah, I would even like to do some some uh, later night, just odd, random things sometimes. Uh, you know, uh, they're kind of fun because you get the night, late night crowd. I uh, know your brother is saying that I think you're overlooking one of the best rewards you get in game. Uh, no, Davis, actually, that's, that wasn't actually on the list either. The next two things are monster extracts and raw materials. Uh, so go ahead and write that up, Davis, because he's right. I mean, actually, part of, part of the rewards, and I'm assuming this is where he's going for, what he's going for. Is part of the rewards is actually succeeding successfully completing the mission that um, you've done X and you've 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 done it. I mean, you've actually succeeded. In Davis's game, that's extremely important because frequently you never do succeed <laughs> the mission. Mostly you die. So, <laughs> so, and I shouldn't I shouldn't say mostly you. Die. Mostly I die. I die in every game. I think I've had one character in Davis's game that survived uh, to any any kind of level. Uh, mostly, I just get um, obliterated. My favorite, my absolute favorite. I think I, I talked about this on Facebook the other day. Um, it, we this is like 1977 or 78. I have no idea. I remember we were in Davis and I, when we were little. We had a room. We shared a room, and he pulled down his D&D books, and I rolled up a character, and I think the first character's name was. Tarzan, and then um, I, I leave the village with a spear. I'm a fighter, and I get killed by some spiders, and it made me mad. So I went back and I made another villager, and I got killed by the same spiders, and I got killed by the same. And this went on until I was 17 or 18 of my characters were killed. And finally, oh. Davis, <laughs> Davis told me that you can't do this anymore. The village has no more warriors left. So <laughs> it's kind of awesome. But uh, yeah, Davis's games can be. Uh, uh, tough, but I love them. That's why. That's actually. I, I like games where death death is a huge part of it. I, I really do, uh, and I always die because I'm always attacking. Uh, so uh, let's let's start the raffle, Chuck. He's about to go on to four. All right, and Davis is actually explaining what he was what he's getting to. So that's so we'll let Davis explain that, uh, and then I'll dive in. You want me to go ahead and dive into four or? Yeah, go ahead and start into four. I'll tell you what, I'll dive into four, and then by that time, Davis should be done with what he's saying, so then we can kind of discuss that. Yeah. How does it, well, he's got to type it. I know he's up on the farm, and <laughs> he's, out, he's out in the wilderness like you are. So. Exactly, yeah. We both take a little while to get everything out, but yeah, go ahead. All right, so for num- number four is actually the hardest that I've ever dealt with, I think. Um, it's I didn't really even have a name for it until I was writing that trick it's something that i deal with almost every three games and i started calling it monster extract uh essentially they kill you know the griffin and they go and take some feathers and take the griffin's eyes or a beak and they kill 
this and they take it to that and the other basically just kind of carving off pieces in the hopes or in the knowledge or whatever it is that these because this is a magical creature as many of these creatures are that these extracts from the monster will bring they can either sell them or they can get something out of them uh, and I've, it's it's kind of one of those things that you struggle with because now you've got it's very random there's I don't know about other game systems, but I think CNC has got well over 300 to 400 monsters in it. So probably 120, 130 of them are magical monsters, which means you could extract stuff, which means you've got to really be on your toes when they're extracting it and trying to sell it or use it to find out actually what what this item would do or, or what it would earn them if they sold it to a wizard or, or what have you. Uh, it's, cool. it's, a, it's a really cool way for characters to gain stuff. It's a really cool way for you to give treasure in those instances where the monster is far from its lair, and a griffin is a perfect example. A griffin doesn't hunt near its lair, a griffin hunts far, it flies, so it's probably 30 or 40 miles from its lair when it attacks you, and you kill it, well, you're not gonna get any treasure from it. However, if you take its eyes out, or what, whatever body part it is you're, you know, going for, then that could actually be the treasure that the characters gain from it, that, more than just the experience of killing the monster. But that leaves you with the challenge of how to value that treasure. Uh, the few, the things that I do probably the most in order to kind of place that is I look at spells that are kind of related to whatever monster they are. Griffin, flight, fly, that type of stuff. And uh, more importantly, potion components. Now, CNC's got a pretty good list of uh, uh, components that go into... Ingredients, rather. Ingredients that go into potions. So you can take these ingredients and kind of reverse engineer what these items might do. Um, there's the simple ones, of course, dragon scales are going to give you, you can make a shield out of it, but what do you do with a, you know, I don't know, off the top of my head, a cockatrice's feathers. What would a cockatrice's feathers actually bring you? So there's any, maybe protection from stone, I don't know, whatever. But So you can kind of reverse engineer these things using potions uh, and even the monster himself. Value is almost impossible to do. It's it's really so random, and it kind of depends on the economy that you've got uh, in your in your game system. Uh, I would recommend that you kind of keep it roughly. The value of the the creatures extracts are roughly equal to the treasure that you would earn from whatever treasure chart you're you're, you're using. So if the cockatrice brings say eighty to two hundred gold pieces then the feathers of the cockatrice are roughly worth 80 to 200 gold pieces. It just keeps it very simple, something I like to do. I don't like to overly make things overly complicated. Um, that gives you a, a quick and easy, quick and dirty way to make, give something of value to it uh, that is really probably not listed in most game systems. Uh, it, would be, it would be an exhausting list to go through all of the magical monsters and what you could extract from them and how much it might, might be worth. So monster extract is really cool. Uh, reverse engineer it through some poison or th through potion ingredients and uh, value it uh, based off of what the monster's actual treasure value is. Did uh, did Davis finish his? Let's see. You want to read it? Or do you want me to read it? Okay. Anyway, so what Kent does? Are you Tim? Are you talking? I forgot I had I forgot I had the uh, sound off because the <laughs> I could <laughs> I could see your mouth moving, but there is no sound. So I. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you sound you sound like Mary. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So here I'll read it. He says anyway. So what Ken does probably subconsciously is allow the development of goals, and then right, point, over a period of game. Point of order. Kent is my middle name. Kent is my middle name. So Davis calls me Kent, for, right. for those who don't know. Now go, sorry, go ahead. That's right. And then over a period of games, months and years, real time and game time, those quests are developed. More than any treasure, it's those aspects of the game that will keep players coming back for more and more. And I think that was it. He, he, what he's actually talking about, um, and I do that a lot because my campaign arcs, uh, when I build, when, I, when I'm running the games, and the ones that I do every week, I build these kind of arcs into it. Now, I've got kind of thematic things that I'm doing, but they're very loose, and I start responding to the characters, to what the characters are kind of interested in doing, uh, quests that they're going on, uh, the directions they're taking their, their 
character, the players are interested in the directions they're taking their, their players. And then I begin to kind of build on that so that they're already interested in doing X. So I start building a thematic thing around X. Uh, and this in, gets them more enthusiastic to come back to the table because their goals are actually now part of the game. Uh, and that gives me something to kind of tie into and, and run with. And a, a absolutely perfect example of this is the game that we're doing now. So, and Davis and Mac Golden, who are playing in the game, uh, Davis is kind of backed out for about a year or so, but uh, uh, basically they're in the Darkened Fold. To do it very, very short, they're in the Darkened Fold. They want to restore the Darkened Fold to its original glory, which is the, called the Eth Fold, a force about four times as large. Uh, the only way they can do that is with the help of the gods. To get the gods to help them, they have to reverse what's called, and this is the world of Eric, what's called the Judgment of Corthane. To do that, they have to bring Orin Duel back. Uh, the Red God. So the campaign, when once they began on this quest to restore the, the Darkened Folds, which was their their idea to restore the Darkened Fold to its original size, I think Davis was really the catalyst behind that, and then Mac jumped on that bandwagon in a heartbeat. Once they got into that, that just played in with all of the thematic things that I had kind of laid down with the, the gods that were in the region, which are called the Old Gods, the Augaust. Uh, the Ethram and all those thematic things that I had just toyed with on the edges of the game, and it all kind of rolled together into now we've got this. It's been going on for about two years. Their quest to bring Orndul, because he was banished from the plane, to bring Orndul back uh, to the plane to reverse the judgment to bring back the Ethel. So that that too is part of that's part of the um, that's kind of more of an esoteric treasure, but it definitely is something that motivates players to come back if you can build thematic elements that, that your players are interested in. They can't just be something you've concocted. They can, but I wouldn't recommend that they be just something that you've concocted, but rather something that you've built with the players over time. When you start at first level, it's nothing really huge, but by third level, you've, you're toying with themes, uh, and they're starting to kind of warm to their characters, so they're toying with things uh, things that they are interested in, and you start shifting your, your GMing in that direction, kind of engulf their what they're looking for and, and expand it, make it part of the thematic stuff. This this really does excite people. That actually would be a good another good uh, GM's trick to the trade, how to develop uh, epic, them not epic, but um, thematic elements for a campaign. So we will mark that down for three weeks from now. All right. Uh, I see a lot of people are throwing some cool ideas uh Cockatrice claws for use as arrows of petrification arrowheads. That's very cool. Uh, and that's that's kind of what I'm talking about. Uh, you can come up with it. It's not insanely difficult, but it can be challenging on the fly, and it can get kind of old. Uh, monster extract is really a cool treasure, but it can be a little bit uh, uh, all-consuming. All Let's see, what do we got um, here? So, Dave said quickling blood, blood is a haste potion. Um... So Epi won the CKG. Is that who won? I think it says Ep Ep EpiCam 1981. Oh, yeah. Very cool. Well, Good deal. Very nice. Yeah. Get them into something else there for sure. Uh, hey, uh, Coralwyn asked something back a few minutes ago, saying, "Is that info in M and T?" And I think she was talking about number three. No, mm -hmm. um, she's probably talking about monster extract. Uh, well, okay, oh, yeah. Extraordinary Items is in the Monsters and Treasures, uh, but the Potion Extracts is in the Castle Keeper's Guide page. I was looking at it the other day, um, and it's not, like, um, all-encompassing. It gives you, it's page 295 in the second printing of the Castle Keeper's Guide. It's not all-encompassing, but it gives you kind of a nice uh, framework to work under. Uh, I actually would like that to be even larger. I'd like all potions to have kind of what's in them. Uh, maybe that would be a, a a book that we do do yet. So Coraline, yes, it's in it's page uh, two ninety five of the Castle Keeper's Guide. Uh, I would really like to kind of expand on that immensely. Okay. There's all, all right. kinds of stuff that we could do with this stuff. I mean, this is. Go ahead. Um, no, I, I, I just uh, was double-checking through there to make sure we covered everything. You've still got uh, number five to go, right? Yep, got the last one. I was about to dive into it unless you got something. No, uh, just, just make sure we open it for some questions afterward. Absolutely. 
All right, so the last one kind of it joined my game very, very late, um, really only about seven or eight years ago. Uh, essentially, I've had a few players who play very specialized characters, and the magic, the, the stuff as you roll in the Monsters and Treasure or whatever book is, it's limited in that it's kind of geared, and it, I'm, I'm going to way overstate this, but it's kind of geared for fighters and wizards. Uh, certainly knights and paladins have can get armor and all this other stuff, but if you're playing a monk, there's not a lot of specialized items that are in there. And if you're playing a fighter that's specialized in this weapon, or if you've developed your character that you use these types of weapons, the vast majority, or armor, the vast majority of items in the, the Monsters and Treasure becomes, or in these treasure lists, becomes kind of, it, I mean, it's useful. The characters can take it, uh, they can sell it, they can use it, of course, they can carry it. But for those who have specialized, it's really just something they don't want. Um, so they end up running 5, 6, 10, 15 games, and they're really not getting anything for their character that enhances their abilities or makes their characters any better or uh, allows them to kind of expand into whatever visionary direction that they want to take their, their character. So what I started to do uh, was actually put in just raw materials. Instead of a, 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 an axe that's a plus two magical axe, they find, you know, three bars of, of adamantine steel. And now they can take this steel or unworked metals of some, whatever it is. I think yeah, in various charts, I know in the CKG somewhere it gives you what type of steel gains you a bonus. So you take that and you give the raw metals to it. So they can actually take that item, take that raw material to a blacksmith, pay the blacksmith money and have made whatever it is they want made. Uh, it just it, it simplifies things in that now I don't have to kind of pour through this tre treasure chart and find something that's useful, which I kind of hate doing. I kind of feel like I'm cheating a little bit when I, when I specifically pick items. It's okay to do it once in a while. I, I picked this item for this character here, but about the third or fourth time you're doing it, it's a little bit, you know, it, it just doesn't feel right. It doesn't feel... You're taking chance out of the game, and now you're just giving somebody something where everybody else has to deal with uh, chance and stuff like that. So I think if you take these raw metals, it gives you a little bit of a, a wiggle room so that they can take it and make whatever they want. And the raw metals doesn't have to actually specifically be metals. It can be the, the, a unicorn horn that they can make the haft of an axe out of. Uh, it can be any number of a, a million things that you... The monster extract, really, that uh, can now be turned into something that the player wants for his or her character when they're actually playing it. Um, so that, that's, the, that's the last, that's the fifth trick of the trade there. All right, excellent. Good job. Uh, so I know that uh, one person mentioned uh, to me that they had a question. Um, so if you anybody else has a question, feel free to just throw it in the stream chat and we'll, we'll get you answered up. Uh, yeah, real quick, to, yeah, Googleplex, uh, he's kind of echoing one of what I mentioned earlier. Uh, he has his players list actually list their goals on their, their character sheet so he knows what they're doing, and it helps him develop the campaign as it goes without going too, you know, off kilter with what the players may want. Well, look at that. We had an anonymous gifter give Banks a guess up. Oh, very cool. Very nice, anonymous, whoever you are. And, and I think Chuck had a question. I know that was the, that was the question I was uh, about to come up, but he might be doing some admin stuff. Uh, but uh, what did Brian else say? Uh, that's all cool. I never thought to give this raw elements and let the PCs customize. Yeah. Yeah, it really it 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 really has kind of made things a lot easier on me and more fun for them, I think. Um, and like I said, there's lists everywhere. Uh, and it's something that came late to my game. It took me quite a while to realize it and, and quite a few disappointed treasure rolls uh, to start thinking, you know, I gotta do something different here to make these guys excited. Yeah, make it, make it happen. Well, um, before we wrap up then, do we have anything else uh, that, uh, oh, there he is. He says he has a question that's kind of off topic somewhat. Uh, how do you handle players that are not ready or indecisive on their turn or even a whole group? Uh, yeah, that's actually very, very, very common. Um, 
I, what I used to do, and I've kind of backed off on this unless it's something that, unless I need the rounds to be going very, very fast. I used to hold my hand up and, and it would, you had five seconds to respond. Uh, and if you didn't, then I, you just went to the next. But that a lot of people don't respond to pressure like that, and a lot of people don't like, you know, they didn't come to the game to, to feel the pressure of the stock market on top of it. You know, ah, I got to buy now. So it, it, it's something I really don't do often, even on my Thursday night game. Uh, and for the, those characters who, those players who are kind of indecisive or who are shy, you have a lot of people who just sit at the table and they don't necessarily, they want to play, they're having a good time, but they're not necessarily diving into everything like you, you would like. Uh, generally speaking, uh, when I do my initiative, and of course I change, you know, I think I talked about this in a, a trick of the trade many, many issues ago, but... Uh, I always change the initiative. Every, you roll initiative every single round, and this kind of, uh, it mixes everything up, so no one really knows when they're going to be going in the round. Now, I generally go from right to left as I'm, as I'm playing things out, um, but what I do, when I, because with that little bit of chaos in there, it helps me when I, when I hit that indecisive character or that shy character, and I can say, what do you do if they say, uh, if they hesitate or if they're, clearly embarrassed, you know, they blush or, or whatever it is, or they really just don't know what to do, I'll, I'll basically say, okay, while you're, while you're thinking that out, okay, what do you do? And I go to the next, next person. And that gives the player a little bit more time to, to catch their breath and figure out what it is they want to do. Now, if they continue to be decisive, I'll kind of, indecisive, I'll kind of warn them, all right, now you're going to lose your initiative round if you don't do something. But I stress, I always stress to players, you don't have to do anything. Just because it's your round, it doesn't mean, I mean, there's plenty of people all over the planet who don't do anything for you know, a solid 20 seconds. Frequently, I just sit here kind of staring at the wall trying to figure out what I'm supposed to be doing. But uh, I, I really do try not to put the pressure on them because especially, especially, for, especially for shy people, uh, it's just going to make it worse. If you put the hammer down on them and say, hey, you've got, I need to know what you're doing, it's going to make them worse. And then it's going to make them mad or upset. Then you're going to get someone else upset at the table, and it's just not good. So my, my immediate reaction is to skip them and tell them I'll be back to you in just a second before the round uh, and then move on to give them a little bit more time to kind of think about what they're going to do. Um, and then, like I said, a little bit more screws on if... If, if you need something to move very, very quickly, the round's ending, what are you gonna do? Um, and again, they don't have to do anything. But skipping them is, is it, you know, it's not horrible, horrible. <clears throat> yeah, so Davis said, me personally, I give them some time. It all depends on the situation, from 30 seconds to a minute or two, depending on what is happening, sometimes longer. And allowing them to breathe is, a, is absolutely a good thing. That's why I skip to the next person, uh, but you can wait and see you know, how they're gonna respond or, or whatever. Um, it, it, it all works, just so long as you don't put the screws on. That just makes everything worse. Let's see, so, uh, you wanna read that yeah, one? Uh, yeah, uh, what about outside of combat when the characters are taking a very long time to decide what to do, <laughs> even simple to do? <laughs> That can be extremely frustrating, uh, especially if they've missed something and you've got to re-explain everything. And um, I don't know. Usually, what I try to do is I, I well, I do know. I stress the role playing. I try to when I see someone that's kind of dragging their feet at the table, I will say, okay, let's role play this out. Let's everybody let's make sure we're in character and you know what you know, and then have them role play. And that helps a little bit in that they become part of, their, you know, they're actually part of a conversation. And if you've got even just one good role player at the table, uh, you'll usually kind of draw that person out a little bit uh, to help them make up their mind. But yeah, some, some, <laughs> some, it's very frustrating. Sometimes people just won't make up their mind about something. And if they don't, I just move on. You know, give them two or three minutes or whatever and role play for a couple of minutes. But if nothing's... If nothing's decided, then I just move on. And if it's a, a non-confrontational issue, the bartender comes in, delivers more beer, people are singing, you know, you hear some noises in the street, uh, and no and no decision was made. Uh, but usually, role playing will help that kind of kind of tip that over the the edge and get them going. Good point. 
I see Google uh, Googleplex says sometimes the time limit can be imposed on the actions to to stimulate things in a really tense, fast-paced fight, such as a vampire or an attacker doing fast flyby attacks, and the PCs only have a moment to counterattack. Yeah, that's that's in such situations. That's where I, I do that. The five fingers. You've got five seconds to respond. Five seconds is actually an extremely long amount of time when you're responding to stressful situations. So, um, you know, it, it should be an ample amount of time to actually come up with something. But And if you miss it, you miss it. If my fifth finger's down, your round is over, I'm on to the next person. Uh, and then they can just brace for the next round. Uh, that's kind of how I do that. If I want that fast-paced combat, which I've, I, I do. I, I've kind of dropped off the five-finger thing, and I quit doing it at conventions. That kind of unnerves people who are new to the game or what have you. But, uh, um, but yeah. for my, my players, I'm a little little harder on my players. Well, you, I've seen you at your big game stuff. So, uh, you sort of lead people. You know, if, if they're having a tough time about what they want to do, you'll give them some suggestions. Yeah, and what I do when I... That's a good point. I kind of what when you what you're talking about because I never specifically remember when they were, they couldn't decide if they're coming off the cliff there at Gamehole Con. Uh, some of the party was down on the trail, and three or four were up on the cliff. And I kind of describe the cliff as giving away a little bit. It's not going to collapse. You're not going to fall, but you're standing here. Rocks are sliding out from underneath you. It's getting a little bit unstable. So they kind of feel a little bit more pressure to do something. And I'm specifically trying to get them to go down, and that's why the rocks are falling down. Uh, and that helps sometimes to get people to move. Sometimes you're going to have some Austin people who just aren't going to make up their just their minds, and that's just that's just the way it is. Uh, let's see, Googleplex says a lot of my players are brand new gamers, so if they are hesitant, I'll sometimes give them a few options as questions. Yeah, that's good. Always lead them with questions so that they know. Uh, especially if they're video gamers, they don't, a lot of them don't know that they can do, they can try anything. They're kind of used to waiting for, can I swim that river? I don't have a swim skill, so I can't swim the river. Well, of course you can swim the river. You can try anything that you want. You might die, but you can do it. But, uh, uh, yeah, a little bit of leading questions is good too, without a doubt. Man, I saw that second right. thing he said is just help them sing along. And I thought, what, you're doing sing-alongs? Well, now that's interesting. <laughs> I just injected the word sing into the sentence for some strange reason. <laughs> uh, well, do we have any other questions before, uh, before we wrap this up? Yeah, I think we've gone over all five. We've got another one which should be out next week. We're going to do uh, monster balancing, uh, which I'll talk about high and low, uh, taking the same encounter and making it work for whatever kind of game that you're running and then uh, we'll follow that up with uh, low level games kind of segue from there excellent all right so guys uh, thanks for showing up tonight and if uh, you have any questions please uh, please uh, send your questions to let's see to product support yes, uh, product support at trollboard.com uh, we'll be glad to, uh, to answer them if we can. Uh, I think you saw, if you got the newsletter today, you'll know that uh, that Steve answered one of the questions. So we're going to start doing some Q&A, and we'll try to put some of those out here on the Twitch as well. It all sounds good. Uh, thanks, Rhino, for the support. Thanks, everybody. Googleplex, everybody. Snow, Twitter, Cor Coraloon. Uh, everybody for showing up and uh, hanging out with us tonight. Um, and thanks, Chuck, for getting this thing rolling forward more and more. Yeah, okay, no appreciate it. And I will check my email, uh, Todd, I promise. Wait, Davis uh, is still saying Davis is, a, or lack of direction, sort of like being in a lake and needing to get to a shore real quick because of a storm. All the shores are equidistant. You sort of got to sort of get sort of lost with option paralysis. Yeah, definitely, without a, doubt. With, without a doubt. Players do it all the time. Of course, GMs do it too. We just can hide behind the screen when we get uh, <laughs> some kind of paralysis going on. <laughs> All right. Thanks a lot, everybody. Have a, have a good night. Have a good night, guys. Thank you.